Hello, everybody. I'd like to introduce to you Islam. And to begin with, I'd like to say peace to you. And that would be Salam, is how you would greet somebody um, in the Islamic tradition. Let me share the screen and bring us over to our module on Islam. Now, the word Islam itself uh, means uh, to surrender to the will of Allah. Allah is referenced for God. And a Muslim is one who does surrender to the will of Allah. So the religion is Islam, and the follower of the religion is a Muslim. And here is a symbol that you sometimes see in Islamic countries. It's the crescent moon and the star. The crescent, the moon, and the star actually go back centuries upon centuries, several thousand years. But it's the Ottoman Empire in Turkey that really took upon that image as a symbol. And it's sometimes, um, I'm sorry, and it has been popularized kind of representing Islam today for many people. My emails are getting some emails. That's why it's doing that little buzz sound. So please forgive me for that. So uh, moving down here, let's do an introduction. Well, one of the first things I wanted to introduce before I go into the background is just talking about the numbers, the locations and so forth. So in terms of the numbers, um, I used to say when I was first teaching at Mount Sac that they were as close to 1 billion. And then I said, oh, there's over a billion. And now there's over 1.8. 5 billion, actually closer to 1.6 billion. And so it is growing exponentially. They predict, and I, who's they is the Pew Institute, predicts that by 2050, it will be equal in terms of numbers to Christianity. And by 2070, it could surpass Christianity. What can account for the fact that it's exponentially growing? Um, you can use meme theory to help explain it to some degree. One thing to note, is that in Islam, conversion is fairly simple. And when you have that simplicity aspect, it helps the religion in terms of its growth. And what I mean by simplicity is, if you were to say the creed, the Islamic creed is, there is one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. And if I tried it in Arabic, I will embarrass myself, but I will try just for fun. Il ilaha illa Allah, Muhammad Rasul Allah. Now, if you're Muslim and you just heard me say that, you're going to be laughing at me, but because I don't have all the intonations or the correctness of that. But nonetheless, there is one God, Allah, Muhammad is his prophet. You say it, you mean it, you have witnesses, you have just converted to becoming a Muslim. So we can see how this religion would take off exponentially in various countries around the world. And where do you see its growth? You see its growth definitely in Africa. You see its growth even in places like Russia and China and so forth. So it is a world religion. A lot of people think of it as a Middle Eastern religion, but the truth be told, four out of every five Muslims are non-Arab. And that's something that most people don't realize. It's only 20% that represents the Arab world. We find Islam very strong in Indonesia. Some of the largest numbers are there. So it's just a world religion, truly. And um, after the beginning of Islam after the prophet dies, it spreads within that hundred year uh, span after the death of the prophet, all the way to Spain and to Europe, and half of the known world was uh, Islamic at one time. So it's very significant in terms of its numbers and its exponential growth. Um, another thing that can account for it is the amount of children. Um, there's oftentimes very large Islamic families, and that also accounts for the numbers exponentially growing. So I wanted to talk about its locations, its numbers, its symbols, some of the main stuff, and I think I covered all of that. So let us begin with the background here, and then when it started and who started it and all of that. Now the first thing to know is how the believers can explain it and how the academics can explain it are gonna be on different footing here. We definitely always need to respect and honor the believer's perspective, but at the same time, do justice to the social historical academic side here. So the believer's perspective is that when I talk about the origins of Islam, I wouldn't start talking about Muhammad because from their perspective, he is the last of a long line of prophets. And these prophets are prophets that you might've heard um, if you are anyway raised in a Christian background or what we call Judeo-Christian background, you might be very familiar with some of these names. So you might be very familiar with Abraham. You might be very familiar with Moses and David and um, all the classic Judeo-Christian uh, prophets that bring us even up to Jesus. And they also recognize Jesus. So that would be an example of somebody they see as a prophet. And so this whole long line of prophets uh, bringing them up to the prophet Muhammad, they recognize as the last of a long line of prophets. So what's so interesting is that if you ask 
in Muslim, when it started, it goes back to the beginning. Um, from their perspective, they even may talk about Adam and Eve and the stories within Genesis and so forth. So they trace it far back in history, and then Muhammad would be the last of a long line. They have concepts of the end of the world coming very similar to a Christian perspective, the end times, eschatology is what's that called. So there's a lot of layering of ideas of Christianity and Judaism within Islam. So that's something that a lot of students are not familiar with. And I'd like to talk about that and spend a little bit of energy on that. But a believer would say, it didn't start with Muhammad. That's where I'm getting to. Now, an academic would say, well, here we have um, in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia, here we have perhaps the genius of Muhammad, if you want to argue that, but we, here we have somebody who is able to pull Jewish and Christian and Zoroastrian and tribal ideas together and put them in a context that made sense and was presented um, to the world. And that became uh, what we know as the religion of Islam today. So from the academic perspective, the founder of Islam is Muhammad. So that's something that would vary from a believer to an academic side there. Okay, the background. So I've started to give you a little bit of a hint here, but in Judaism, we have this concept of prophets and a line of prophets throughout Jewish history. And those same prophets are part of Islam. And I'd like to point this out and kind of connect it to the concept of memes and piggyback memes. And if you remember meme theory, it's the idea that a meme can be more popular if it piggybacks on an already popular idea. So memes are much more, um, much more accepted by society if it already pulls from ideas people are comfortable with and familiar with. So that whole idea of prophets and the same Jewish prophets are the same prophets within Islam. That needs to be noted. Judaism traces its lineage back to Abraham and so does Islam. But they trace it back to different sons. Abraham, who's recognized as the founding father of Judaism, is kind of recognized in, in this context as a founding father of Islam as well. But through his first son, in Islam, they trace it back to Abraham through his first son. His first son was Ishmael. And it's argued that um, Abraham had a wife, Sarah. He had a second son with Sarah, and that was Isaac. So Judaism traces their religion back to Abraham through his second son. Isaac, where Islam traces it back to his first son, Ishmael, with his um, cohort, I guess you can say, and or concubine, and that would be Hagar. So that's very interesting. If you look at upon it that, that way, it kind of sees Judaism and Islam as cousin religions, because they're both tracing it back to two sons here from the same father. And another similarity with Judaism is the diet. So in Judaism and in Islam, there is no eating of pork. That's obviously a, a piggyback connection there. And there's also how the animals killed. Halal meat and kosher meat has to be killed um, with a quick instantaneous death and no consciousness and little as pain as possible. And then both Judaism and Islam um, argues for circumcision for the males. And what age that occurs, um, in Islam depends upon the different country you're talking about. Sometimes it's in, in terms of the infant being weeks old, days old, sometimes the child is like eight years old, sometimes it's uh, right at puberty time. It depends upon the country in which uh, age is highlighted, but circumcision is found in both of those. Christianity. Um, Christianity definitely is found, a lot of Christian themes are found within Islam. Number one is the role of Jesus. Jesus is viewed not as the son of God, that would be a blasphemous concept in terms of um, the idea of God having a son, that would mean a second kind of concept of God, and then the Holy Spirit, that whole Trinity concept would be viewed as polytheism from their viewpoint. They're very, very strict monotheists. And so that to them would be unacceptable. But they do see Jesus as somebody who is a prophet and somebody who is carrying on the teachings of the prophets before him. And, um, you know, a prophet of God having a very, very special role. So much so that they do not think that Jesus was crucified um, because that would be kind of a horrific end to a prophet's life. And so that when there was a crucifixion, it was somebody who kind of looked like Jesus or was mistaken to be, but not Jesus himself. Another interesting idea about Jesus is at the end of the world, they argue uh, that Jesus will come. This is the eschatology stuff. So they believe in the day of judgment 
They believe in Jesus returning at the, that time, at the day of judgment. They believe in a resurrection of the dead, very similar ideas you'll find in Christianity. All of that's there within Islam as well. They also talk a lot about um, the virgin birth. They talk about the role of Mary. They talk about Jesus' birth in the Quran itself. Fascinating stuff. Uh, described a little bit differently in his birth story than you'll find in the New Testament, but very interesting nonetheless. Um, Mary being the mother and Mary being the virgin. They talk about the ascension of Jesus into heaven. That's also there. So there's such overlap, so many themes that are very similar here. Okay, moving on to Zoroastrianism. I have a lot to cover, so I'm still only on bullet number two here, or three here. Zoroastrianism is a Persian religion uh, connected back to Zoroaster of 2,500 years ago. And it's it supposed to be a philosophy that Zoroaster articulated that's very dualistic. It's this idea of there's that world, the heavenly world, and then the earthly world, and then the hellish world. So there's like multiple realities, but there's the heaven and the hell beyond the planet earth. And these heaven and hell concepts is not found in Judaism um, until Zoroastrian influence. So Zoroastrian really brings it into Judaism, and then Judaism through Pharisee Judaism brings it into Christianity. And so Zoroastrian Zoroastrian thought played a huge role here. And um, the idea of there's a good God versus a Satan kind of character, the good versus the evil, the light versus the dark, the role of angels and all of this, um, all of that predates um, Christianity and predates Islam. And all of that can be traced back to Zoroastrian thought. Okay, time for tea, just one sec. Okay, pre-Islamic native religions. This is kind of the tribal religions of the Arab people at that time. And they were, these tribal religions traditionally are polytheistic, and they were, but they had this idea that there was a head god, and the reference to head god was Allah. And they argued that Allah had many consorts, not Islam didn't, but I'm talking about the tribal religions at that time. So this idea of Allah as the head god gets placed as the god of Islam. And so that was... Again, in Arabic, it simply means the God or God, but it's interesting that um, that, that concept of the tribal religions, um, multiple gods, and but there's the head God, that head God became uh, the God um, in Islam. Okay, I hope that all was clear there. So a lot of this is interesting piggyback means that gets pulled into Islam. And again, that's the academic perspective here. And then we're going to talk about the prophet and the prophet Muhammad. And if I was truly to be correct, I would say peace be upon him after saying uh, his name, prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And to learn about his dates, his family, his location, his career, and the big, huge role he played in Islam. So we're going to be talking about um, his dates for a second and his location. So let's do his location first. This is in Saudi Arabia and specifically Mecca. And Mecca was considered a metropolitan, metro, uh, a multicultural city. That's the word I'm looking for. A multicultural city where there was a lot of Jewish ideas, Christian ideas, Zoroastrian ideas, tribal ideas in that city. And it was um, a time period. He was born in 570. CE and he passed away in 632 so he was 62 years old so um, this time period I guess we're going to be talking about it primarily the origin of Islam is the 7th century okay so 600s there his family um, he was considered an orphan by his mo mother and his father his father I think I believe and I hope I'm correct his father died when he before he was born then his mother died shortly later when he was a little boy and he was raised by his grandfather for a while and eventually his uncle and he was born in a very poor very poor environment um, with no education whatsoever it said he was illiterate and that's kind of significant because he's connected to be responsible for the Quran not by the writing of it but by the recitation of it the verbal uh, words of it and it's said around the age of 25, and I'm giving you just a real quick synopsis here because I don't have time to go too much in depth. But around the age of 25, he uh, fell in love with a, he worked for a woman named Khadija and he fell in love with her. And she was 15 years his senior is my understanding. And um, my, also my understanding is that she proposed and they got married and they had six children together. And he was only married to Khadija while Khadija was alive. But when she passed, 
And I guess his uncle passed at the same year. So it was called the year of sorrow and year of sadness for him. When she passed, um, that is when he married other, other wives. And a lot of those wives were viewed to be uh, wives of women. I'm sorry, the wives of men who had died in battle. So it was kind of one um, to help out uh, in, that, in that context. It has to be placed in that context. Now, it said around the age of 40, he had revelations and he went up to pray up in the mount, mountains called Mount Hera. And he had this incredible experience, kind of a mystical, ecstatic experience. And he felt pressure in his chest and kind of a dizziness and a sweat. And he just felt almost like an out-of-body experience. And he heard um, kind of somebody say, I need you to recite. And he's like, but I'm illiterate. I don't read. I don't write. And he said, recite, recite. And that is what the word Quran means to recite. It said that these revelations um, happened for the course of from 40 into about 62, so 22, 23 years. And those revelations were eventually recorded by scribes and became um, the Quran. The Quran is not organized chronologically from the first revelation to the last, but in terms of the length of the, of the actual passage. So that's also interesting to know. So when he comes out of this first experience, he comes to his wife, Khadija, he tells her about it, and she becomes his first convert. So that's very fascinating. Okay, now um, eventually there's a lot of, and I'm trying to summarize this pretty quickly, but there's a lot of tension in uh, Mecca. People see him as somebody who's challenging the polytheism in, of the tribal people. He's arguing from a monotheistic perspective. Um, he is against idols. You know, he wants to get rid of the idols in the holy shrine called the, um, the Kaaba. So there's certain things that set the people off and there's a tension and there was an assassination attempt. So he flees with 70 other families from Mecca to a nearby town, but it's not too nearby. I think it's like 250 miles away, um, but it's quite a while away. It's uh, Medina. Oh, I think it's that distance in Saudi Arabia. And while he's in Medina, um, there was military campaign and wars that happened between Mecca and Medina. And eventually Mecca fell um, and surrendered and, uh, the Islamic uh, families went in and, and um, the people in that area were eventually uh, converted to Islam. Now, it's not said they were converted by the sword. There wasn't supposed to be, there was a lot of bloodshed in that military wars for many years, but when he actually went into Mecca, there was not the bloodshed that one would expect. It was more of a surrendering. Then following the life of the prophet, there are four successors. And these four successors are called the Caliphs. And this is a Sunni perspective. I'm kind of jumping you into the branches, but I'll hold off for a second. But just to let you know that when he dies, when the prophet dies around the age of 62, there are four successors that are recognized by a large majority of Muslims. Not all Muslims will accept that. Um, and there is an expansion of the Islamic empire or the Islamic civilization. There's two dynasties I'm pointing out. One is this U dynasty here. And for a hundred years, there was an expansion of Islam, and that's where it took off even to Spain and across half of the known world. And then following that dynasty, um, the Ab Abbasids, that there you go, Abbasids came in for 500 years. And this dynasty is referred to as the Golden Age Dynasty, where they ushered in uh, medicine and art and science and philosophy and invention and such great contributions to human society from the golden age for those 500 years. We also have some beautiful poetry by Brumi, which we'll uh, study as well a little bit in this class in the next lesson plan. Okay, moving down um, to the main theolo theology of the religion or the main precepts here, we've got two things to talk about. We've got the five pillars and, you know, it's a little dark. Let me turn on the light real quick. There we go. Yay, I can see. We have the five pillars and the six articles of faith. So I'd like to discuss those with you very quickly and then uh, talk about the text. Uh, a few other important ideas and then the branches. I'm gonna hold this off for the next lesson plan when we cover Sufism. So let's go up here. The five pillars. The five pillars are the five uh, main, kind of like almost actions I should say. These are more like the beliefs and these are the actions. So one is the creed, the Shahada. There is one God, Allah, Muhammad is his prophet. Il Allah, ila Allah, Muhammad's prophet Allah. Okay, again, I didn't do it right. And then we have prayer, which is Salat. And Salat is five times a day. And it's when this, in the morning before the sun comes up. 
and then it is um, at noon, and then it is in the afternoon, and then it's when the sun is going down, and then it's at night, uh, when the, right before you go to bed when the sun has already gone down. So those are prayers five times a day. What's remarkable about that is that's a commitment. If you think about it, most religions do not pray five times a day. Most religions pray once a week or maybe at night before you go to bed for a few seconds. But that prayer five times a day is definitely a great commitment and um, to be recognized as that. And then let's jump down here to the Hajj. Um, the Hajj is the pilgrimage and the Hajj is to, uh, every good Muslim is supposed to go at least one time in their life um, to Mecca to experience the, uh, the Hajj experience there. The big holy shrine there is called the Kaaba and they're supposed to uh, experience what it's like. Um, it's said that all Muslims go equal in the eyes of God. Everybody dresses down, no jewelry, no makeup, um, simple, usually kind of a white linen is worn and um, all go as brothers and sisters kind of is how it's argued. And it is only open, the Hajj is only open to Muslims, so you couldn't just go and observe it. You have to be Muslim to go on the actual Hajj experience. And um, it's really a neat thing. And then we have Zakat. Zakat is the idea of charity. And Zakat is um, argued that every good Muslim should give two and a half percent of their income to help the needy, to help the poor, to help the destitute. And in some Islamic countries, it's required and taken out of one's paycheck, but in places like America, it is freely given. And that's two and a half percent is one fortieth. A lot of people say, oh, well, in, uh, I've heard students say, well, in Christianity, it's, it's 10%, you know, this is two and a half, it's not that big deal. But the 10% is really, <sighs> I was raised in that Christian background. It's really totally optional. I mean, I remember as a kid when the basket would go by, my dad would pop in a $5 bill. I mean, it wasn't really a requirement. In Islam, it's definitely much more of a requirement. And um, then we have this one here, Swan, and it's argued to be um, fasting. And it's in honor of the uh, time when the prophet, it's in honor of Ramadan. And that's in honor of the time when the prophet received uh, the first revelations and um, it's argued that for the whole month of Ramadan while the sun is up um, you eat nothing you drink nothing and that's no food no water anything in the mouth and I've heard some Muslim students tell me they don't even brush their teeth they don't have you know to have a little tic-tac in their mouth nothing enters the mouth while the sun is up so they'll get up really early they'll get up before the sun's up they'll have a big breakfast They'll have a big glasses of water, they'll brush their teeth, and then the sun comes up, and then nothing until the sun has gone down. And that's for an entire month. So it's a real, very sincere commitment um, to do that. And they say that it's to experience what it is not to have, to experience those that don't have. Like remember, zakat is to help out the needy. It's to experience what the needy go through and, and uh, to develop a sense of uh, empathy and compassion. Okay, so those are the five pillars, a lot dealing with action. And these are the articles of faith. And looking at the clock, I just have about 10 more minutes. Um, so the main belief systems is they believe in Allah as the one true God, very monotheistic. And they believe that concepts of angels, which may have as a rastering and root. And the holy book concept is the Quran, which I've already covered. Um, the belief in prophets. And again, they'll even talk about Adam. Um, and Moses and David and Jesus, Isa and uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him. See, that's there is a final prophet. They believe there'll be end times where there'll be a day of judgment and people will kind of like, will go on the, to heaven or hell and Jesus will appear at the right hand of Allah kind of thing. Um, there's definitely a belief in predestination in Islam, but everything's in, in the will of Allah and all one can do is surrender to it. And um, in that surrendering, it's kind of almost like a stoic message if you've ever studied that in philosophy and that idea of everything's out of your hands and all you could do is surrender to it. And um, therefore, you know, yes, there, there's a concept that here I have, Muslims believe that just doesn't stop human beings from making free choices. So yes, you, you basically ultimately should surrender to the will of Allah, um, but it's kind of this paradox, do you have free will or not in light of that? So that's always been a 
philosophical problem that some religions have to deal with when they're arguing everything's ultimately out of your hands, but then do I ever choose anything? Yes, you choose, I think they would say, but what you're choosing is to either surrender, submit, or to fight against it kind of thing and not be um, respecting of the will of Allah. And the text here, um, the Quran is their holy text, which was already mentioned. It literally means to recite. It's not arranged chronologically from the first to the last revelation, but in terms of its length, when you open the Quran, the back of the book is the uh, beginning of the book. And uh, the first, uh, some doors are being shut in my house. I apologize for that. So the first uh, chapter or um, surah is what it's called. The first chapter um, is very lengthy and then it goes on and on. It gets shorter and shorter is the general pattern. And then we have what's called the sunnah. And the sunnah is a mixture of hadith and surah. So let me explain those terms. The hadith are sayings of the prophet. It's not while he's in a revelation. It's just his moral insights uh, and his statements about how to live a good life. That's the hadith. And then surah are his actual actions. So you mix his words with his actions. And then you have the sunnah. This is not while in revelation. It's just how the prophet is viewed as somebody to emulate, to model. And that's what you have, his words and his actions to do that. And then sharia law refers to Islamic law. And um, certain countries uh, implement the sharia law. They take the Quran as not just a holy book but almost like a political book, a societal book of how to live and how to, um, uh, how to uh, chastise and how to, um, oh, why, why did I say chastise? Because, I mean, certain rules, if you get, uh, if you break certain laws of what the Islamic law would, what the repercussions with that would be. That's what I meant. I'm sorry, I said the wrong word choice there. And then other important ideas, um, so the position of women in Islam, it's often said, oh, women aren't treated equal. But from their perspective, there's been huge strides, huge improvement that the prophet implemented in his day and age. And one was that he implemented that um, women could inherit. That was a big significance um, that prior that women could not. He also said that it would be acceptable in abusive situations where women could divorce their husbands and there would be a cooling off period between her saying, I divorce you, and then time to reflect, a cooling up period, a second time saying it, a cooling up period. By the third time I say, I divorce you, then you are uh, divorced in the Islamic uh, tradition. And so there, it, it does allow for that and to get out of abusive situations. No female infanticide prior to that. It was common for female um, infants to be killed. And the limit of wives prior to Muhammad, there was no limit. He set the limit to four, arguing that each wife had to be treated equally and fairly and respected as such. So um, from a modern perspective, a lot of people will say, well, women aren't treated fairly, you know, in Saudi Arabia is an example, but that a lot of uh, people would challenge that saying that's not so much about Islam, it's so much that's about the uh, Saudi Arabian culture. So that's um, certain things that one can investigate. This is an article if you wanted to read more on that. Now taboos, certain things you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to eat pork, as I mentioned, there's no drinking of alcohol in Islam, no sexual misconduct as well. Um, pretty strict on arguing for heterosexual relationships as well in Islam. Some tension there if uh, one um, pursued sexuality in different orientations. Okay, I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that may not rub well with some of you, but there is um, that's a traditional perspective, and you'll find that in some of the Western religions as well. Now, the jihad—you've heard that word before in the media, and it really means um, struggle. It means internal struggle. It means to strive to become kind of a better person. So jihad sometimes gets translated in the media as holy war, but it's not a holy war necessarily against the enemy. It's the, within your own consciousness. It's trying to strive. It's trying to struggle against your ego and strive to become a better person. So it can translate as to struggle or to strive. But they talk about the internal jihad, that's the internal one you personally go through, and the external one where you see cases of um, abuse and you struggle against those or you fight against those. So the problem, I guess one can argue, uh, not against the internal, it's called the greater jihad is the internal, the external is the lesser jihad, that's when you see cases um, where people fight uh, in the name of jihad, fight against oppression, fight against abuse and so forth. Problem is, is sometimes that could be politically abused and, and um, jihad could be pursued 
in the name of jihad, but not necessarily be a justified jihad. So one could say that you have to be careful in what you consider a justifiable external jihad. Now, the word imam it means a prayer leader. There's different types of imams. There's the scholarly imam. There's the imam that's the head of like the mosque, which is what the holy place is called. And then there is the imam that you'll find that reference to the imam in a branch of uh, Islam called the Shiite or Shia. And in terms of the branches, I will cover that next time. What I'd like to do for the next lesson plan is go through the branches and talk about an aspect of Islam. It's a mystical aspect called the Sufi part of Islam. And so we'll talk about the Sunnis, the Shiites, the mystical approach, the nation of Islam, um, and then these two as well, a little bit of the Baha'i and the uh, Madhya uh, Muslims. So I'd like to end. I always try to make sure it's within 30 minutes. I'd like to end with salam. I know I'm putting my hands together. That's more Indian. But uh, nonetheless, uh, peace to you all. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye. Let's end and have a good night.